Foreign baseball players in Asia have many roles, but most take up one of five. First base, DH, corner outfield, starting pitcher, and closer. This makes sense. By the nature of foreign player limits, you want your player to be effective in a role that often isn't filled by a domestic player. Because if you can fill it with a domestic player, why bother wasting one of your limited roster spots on something you don't need? This was sadly the fate of Rick Austin, who despite modern stats saying he was amazing, was let go by the Honkyu Braves after only 8 games, as his perceived wildness was not trusted to start or in high leverage situations. Now, nowadays we know Braves manager Toshiharu Ueda was wrong, given that Austin had a fit minus of 55, but what are you gonna do? Thus, the first full-time foreign reliever to emerge in Japan was Steve Shirley, who took up the mantle of Guardian for the 1983 Lotte Orion, proving the concept. But it wasn't until the late 80s that the concept of the foreign closer became a thing in Japan, with three men taking the mantle. Luis Sanchez of the Yamiuri Giants, Brad Animal Leslie of the Honkyu Braves, and Yuen Shia Kuo of the Chunichi Dragons, also known as Genji Kaku. Kuo was so effective that he won 1988 CL MVP as his Dragons won the pennant, overhaul of famer Hiromitsu Ochiai, team home run leader Masaru Uno, and the team's previous MVP winner, catcher Takayoshi Nakao. While we can look at modern stats and say Ochiai got snubbed, Kuo's MVP was a turning point in NPB history. The closer was now, without a doubt, an invaluable part of the team. No team has proved this more than the Fukuoka Hawks. After grabbing Hall of Famer Goose Gossage for half a season in 1990, they poached former White Sox closer Bobby Thigpen in 1994, and he was excellent for two seasons. Then they had Jose Nunez, whose 1996 was the most valuable season by a foreign Hawks pitcher since the 60s. Then Rod Pedraza spent four excellent seasons as the Hawks closer, helping them to two pennants and their first Japan Series title in over 30 years. Then Brian Falkenberg and Dennis Sarfate guided the club through their 2010s dynasty. While Roberto Osuna's underlying numbers are crap, he's still seen as the current member of the Hawks elite four and closer core. I'm mentioning this because well, while some teams have a smattering of elite four and relievers, the Tokyo Yakult Swallows were not one of them. Not for a long time. Their closers were domestic, with the best being Hirotoshi Ishii and Hall of Famer Shingo Takatsu, but neither hold the club's single season saves record. In fact, the man who does wasn't meant to be a closer at all, but he'd step into the role and channel years of adversity into becoming one of the scariest pitchers in NPB. Tokyo's guardian angel, Tony Barnett. Born in Anchorage, Alaska, but raised in Federal Way, Washington, just south of Seattle, Tony Barnett naturally grew up a massive fan of the Seattle Mariners. After high school, he went to play juco ball in Central Arizona College, before moving up to play for ASU. This got him drafted by the Arizona Diamondbacks in the 10th round of the 2006 MLB Draft. While several other players taken in that round of the draft made the majors, the only player with over 10 career war was Desmond Jennings, although Barnett wasn't the only one who'd end up in Asia. Josh Renicki spent the final three years of his career in Taiwan with the Uni Lions, and Mike McClendon also pitched a year in Taiwan for the brothers. However, Tony was the first to go to Asia, because he hit a roadblock in his career fairly quickly. Despite rocketing through the minors and making AAA in just his fourth professional season, his 5.79 ERA on the Reno Aces was incredibly concerning. Yes, the Pacific Coast League is known for its high ERAs thanks to the sheer amount of teams that play at high elevation, but around 6 was still seen as too high, and he hadn't been called up all year. However, his talent for pitching had caught the eye of a couple NPB teams, who saw his age as a huge plus. He wasn't the only one, but while Aces reliever Bobby Kareki had rebuffed them, he'd forward Barnett's details to a certain Japanese agent, Don Nomura. Tony and his current agent, Dean Steinbeck, were initially skeptical, as Nomura was characteristically cagey about how much he could do, but once Steinbeck realized his agency was literally down the street from Nomura's, the two got to talking. The team that was interested was the Tokyo Yakult Swallows, Tokyo's little brother team. Don was very familiar with the organization, as not only had he played four years on the club's Nigun, or minor league squad, but his stepdad, NPB legend Katsuya Nomura, had managed the club to four pennants and three titles in the mid-1990s. So while Don negotiated with his old club, Tony waited in Arizona with his girlfriend Hillary for the results of the Rule 5 draft. The Rule 5 draft is essentially a way to stop MLB teams from hoarding top minor league talent outside of their 40-man rosters. After 4 or 5 years depending on the age in which the player was signed, these players can be taken by any other club for a $100,000 fee. 
but they have to stay on the major league roster. The only way they can be sent to the minor leagues is by clearing waivers and then being offered back to the original club for 50 grand. If the original club refuses, only then can they be sent down. It's a risky play, and more often than not, the player isn't an impact piece. So not all teams participate. Only 10 did in 2023, for example. Tony was left unprotected by the Diamondbacks, but no one took him. Disheartened, he went to the Diamondbacks and asked them, what role do you see for me? To which they responded that they saw Tony as a fill guy, someone who'd make a spot appearance here and there, but nothing permanent. Tony then asked if they'd release him if an NPB team came calling. The D-backs said yes. So now it was up to Tony to decide what he wanted to do. Knowing that the Swallows were the team that was interested in him, he asked Nomura if he could be put into contact with a current Swallow to kind of feel out the situation. Don put him into contact with the Swallows' Canadian slugger Aaron Guile. A fellow denizen of the Pacific Northwest, Guile had spent three years in Shinjuku at that point in his career, although the situation that led him to go there was different. Guile had appeared in parts of five MLB seasons to that point and had active offers from the Phillies and Rockies to be their fourth outfielder, but he chose Japan. Firstly, he was sick of being a bench bat, and second, they offered double what any MLB team had. Guile laid it out like this. What are the Swallows offering you? Uh, 500k with bonuses and a guaranteed team option if I play well. How much money are you making in Reno? 25 grand. Think about that. And Tony did. He described Thanksgiving with his family as a whirlwind. While NPB had always been major professional, many viewed it at the time as taking a step down for a paycheck. Tony worried that signing in Japan would be the end, as high as he could ever go. And if he failed, it was over. While there had been several players who'd used the playing time NPB offered them as a springboard into MLB, they were still in the minority. His girlfriend Hillary told them that she'd support him no matter what, and his father Phil, who'd been the main driving force for his baseball career, told him that it was his call. One day in mid-December, Hillary came home from exams to find Tony sitting on the living room floor, hands on his head. He didn't need to tell her, because she knew, but he told her anyway. He was Tokyo bound. Two months later, he stepped off the plane at Narita. Chibalote Marines PR man Noriaki Kajiwara lamented that he was too handsome, as the press trained their cameras on him, and not the Marines' two new signings, Bill Murphy and Brian Corey. The press compared him to a Hollywood star, something that made his girlfriend laugh when she read it the next day. Tony would be greeted by Go Fujisawa, who was assigned to him as a personal translator and handler of sorts. Fujisawa was a Tohoku boy from Akita Prefecture who had a master's degree from Indiana State, and was assigned to Barnett because they were the same age, both being 26. While Tony was reluctant to use Fujisawa's services as a translator and assistant more than necessary, the two eventually hit it off, and remain close friends to this day. After spring training, Swallow's manager Shigeru Takada did something you don't often see. He held Tony in reserve. It's almost tradition at this point for NPB managers to chuck their new foreign players into the fire to sink or swim, but considering that the Swallows were starting out against the defending champion Yamiuri Giants and the dominant Shunichi Dragons, Takata had Barnett make a minor league start to warm him up against a weak opponent, that being the Yokohama Bay Stars, who'd barely won 50 games the previous year and would go on to finish last again that season. Barnett had a fantastic debut. Seven innings pitched, zero runs, three hits, three walks, 11 strikeouts. Utterly dominant, especially for a year like 2010, which saw above average offense. An RBI double from former Bay star Ryoji Aikawa was the difference, and the Swallows would win 1-0. But he wouldn't always be facing the Yokohama Bay Stars. While his second start against the Hanshin Tigers was noticeably shakier, including giving up a homer to Craig Grizzell, he still picked up the win as the Swallows demolished the Tigers 8-3. Though his first loss against the Chinichi Dragons was just a mid-start, his first duel with the venerable Kyojin didn't go well. Nine runs given up through three innings of work. Homers from Alex Ramirez, Sung Yop Lee, and Hayato Sakamoto. Granted, all three of those guys are legends, but it was as if the Giants had looked at him and said, You thought this league was easy? Pipe down, rookie. But that was the Giants. That tended to happen. His next start was far more concerning, because it was an interleague start against the Oryx Buffaloes. While most fans who just got into NPB in the 2020s might know the Buffs as a dominant force, for most of the post-merger era, they have been the textbook definition of mid. While Barnett would only give up three runs, he only lasted three innings. Almost two months into his major pro career, Tony had been well and truly figured out. Tony would go six innings in his next start against the Chibalote Marines, 
but they still struck for five runs in the first inning. Still, Tony did better than the others as the Marines whooped the Swallows 20-4 the next day. That little outing got Shigeru Takata fired. Bench coach Junji Ogawa was promoted in his place, and immediately the mood shifted. Takata was always more of a GM than a manager, and his aloofness was criticized heavily by both the younger players and the foreigners. He was also a guy who'd come from outside of the organization, spending his entire career as a Yamiuri giant. While sometimes that can be a good thing, Takata didn't really work to gain the respect of his players, expecting it more than earning. Luckily for him, Takata's legacy as a V9 giant and the man who built the fighters into a mid-2000s force as a GM will always overshadow his lackluster managerial record. Back to Tony, while he would be able to hold down the Cebu lines in his next start, allowing only one run as the Swallows thumped them 12-6, his ERA was still hanging around 5, so he got demoted. Tony didn't like it, but he held his tongue. Aaron Ga was a friend, and Go Fujisawa had, let's just say, creatively translated to his benefit, but the only person he felt he fully trusted was Hillary. Thankfully for him, she was there. She'd skipped her graduation to move to Tokyo, catching his subpar starts against the Buffaloes and Marines. Her presence helped soften the negativity that had been swirling in his head, as Tony described his time on the knee gun as pitching purgatory. Because he wasn't really allowed to pitch that often, because the Swallows wanted to keep him on call unless another starter went down. The fact that Go Fujisawa was the only one at the facility who spoke English just further isolated him. But being able to come home to Hillary after a long, grueling day sweltering in Saitama's summer heat helped keep Tony in check. It didn't help that the next two times he got called up, he got rocked again. The first time was against the Hanshin Tigers, with his dad, stepmom, and stepbrother in attendance. Tony gave up seven runs in 2.2 innings. His dad was so frustrated by Tony's pitching performance that he started shouting at Tony in frustration, drawing the ire of the fans around him who probably didn't realize it was Tony's dad, and thought, who the hell is this unruly foreigner? Then it was down to the minors again for three weeks, before getting called up to face the Giants. Again, it went poorly, seven runs over five innings pitched. The Kyojin would take the game 14-8. While he wasn't saddled with the loss, his ERA was now nearing 6.5 and Tony was getting the sneaking suspicion that he would not be getting that team option. Tony did get his ERA under 6 by the time of his next win, as despite giving up 4 runs in 5.2 innings, the Swallows took the lowly base stars behind the woodshed and won 11-4. After a few more mediocre starts, Tony was demoted for good in August, with the Swallows electing to salvage a lost season by giving some young guys playing time. As soon as Tony was told he wouldn't be back up, he packed his bags and left Japan. By all rights, that should be where our story ends. He failed, his second year option wouldn't be picked up, and it looked like it might be the end of his career. However, a couple days after Christmas, Don Nomura gave Tony a call. The Swallows wanted him back, albeit at a 50% pay cut. Tony was shocked, but agreed to it without a second thought. I mean, it was still 10 times what he'd been making in the MLB minors. In truth, Tony got lucky. Young Su Bai, who the Swallows had signed over from the Samsung Lions, had failed his physical partially due to the fact that he tried to hide the fact he had Hep B. Not wanting to go through the process of trying to find a replacement, Junji Ogawa and the Swallows resolved to bring back a guy they were already familiar with. Tony had gotten a second chance, and he wasn't about to waste it. With a new season, came a new number. 34. Tony didn't know it at the time, but that number was the same one used by the greatest pitcher in NPB history, Masaichi Kaneda, who'd spent the first 15 years of his career as a Swallow, before leaving on bad terms after they decided to move to Jingu in 1965. Putting on that jersey, he was stepping into a shadow he didn't know existed, and putting even more pressure on himself. Very few people live up to that number. But Tony would try, because a new role was waiting for him. Relief pitcher. Tony didn't balk at the role like many would. Knowing that this might be his last shot, he embraced it. He started adding pitches to his repertoire, adding a cutter and a splitter. He did so at the behest of former Swallows ace Tomohito Ito, who'd been with the club during the 90s dynasty years. Ito had taken a special interest in Barnett and gave him the feedback he'd so desperately needed the year before. He wasn't the closer, as that job still belonged to veteran Korean Chang Young Lim, but he was acting as a middle reliever and a setup man, and that suited him well enough. Tony began racking up holds like no one's business. A hold is when a relief pitcher enters a game with a lead of three runs or less and holds that lead for the next guy. It's kind of like a save for non-closers. What helped Tony was the fact that 2011 saw a new, much deader ball. 
not as dead as the ones we're dealing with in 2024, but a massive change from 2010, which had seen three 200-hit seasons from Matt Merton, Nori Aoki, and Tsuyoshi Nishioka. Tony adapted well, and by April, he was already their high-leverage guy. The man who'd been smacked around was gone, and in his place stood an unpredictable, dominant force who was above all things, comfortable. There's one moment Tony remembers in vivid detail, facing Hiroshima Carp legend Tomonori Maeda. Maeda was well past his prime, but was still a Golden Players Club member and a very dangerous pinch hitter. Barnett dropped a splitter on him that made the 21-year vet's jaw drop. When you see that much in baseball, it takes a lot to surprise you. While Tony would miss interleague due to the death of his older brother, he didn't miss a beat when he got back. For the rest of the season, he and Lim became the dominant 1-2 punch at the back of the bullpen. Tony finished the season strong, with a 2.68 ERA and a 2.38 FIP, good for a FIP minus of 68. Utterly dominant. This didn't fully come out of nowhere, as despite his struggles in 2010, he'd still carried a league average FIP. But still, he'd proven the team was right to take him back, and as a reward, the Swallows had turned it around. Despite losing first place to the Dragons, they'd still made the playoffs, and as a reward, they'd be facing their crosstown rivals, the Giants, in what was essentially the wildcard round, with home field advantage in all three games. For those unfamiliar with how the NPB playoffs work, second and third play a best of three at the home park of the second place club, and the winner of that moves on to play the first place team in a best of six in the first place team's park. The winner of the wildcard round must win four games, while the first place team only has to win three. The entire playoffs are referred to as the Climax Series, but in the NPB English community, we typically use the wildcard and CS terminology to help new fans by relating it to MLB. So going forward, while the CLCS should technically refer to the whole Central League Climax Series, I'll only use it for the second round. Tony wouldn't play in the wildcard round, as the Swallows easily took the series, but he would be summoned from the pen in Game 1 of the CLCS against the Dragons. Already playing with a game in hand, the Dragons had chased Tatsuyoshi Masabuchi before the end of the third inning. Tony blunted the Dragons' rally and kept them down until the end of the fourth, but the two runs Masabuchi had given up were more than enough. The Dragons won 2-1. The Swallows would win the next two games to even the series, with Tony being credited for the win in Game 3 after he pitched two and a third shutout innings backing up Kyohei Muranaka. But that was the last action he'd see all season. The Dragons won Game 4 and Game 5, taking the series thanks to the game in hand. It was the first time Tony had pitched on such a big stage, and he knew right then he wanted more. After he and Hillary got married that December, Tony would be back to Tokyo the next season with a new role. Closer. Lim was hurt, and the 35-year-old's age was finally catching up to him, so Tony was going to get his job. He was also getting a new catcher, as his longtime battery mate Ryoji Aikawa's career was winding down. The new man behind the plate was Yuhei Nakamura. Today, we see Nakamura as a veteran catcher known for his adaptability and excellent pitch calling, which netted him Japan Series MVP in 2021 and the role as Samurai Japan's primary catcher in the 2023 WBC. But at this point, he was a bright-eyed 22-year-old kid getting his first real shot at catching, as he only had 21 NPB games under his belt at that point. The two took to each other immediately. Unlike the stoic veteran Aikawa, Nakamura was a sponge. They made a fantastic team. In his first 18 appearances in his new role, Tony didn't give up a single run, and averaged less than 13 pitches per appearance. If you heard ZZ Top sharp dress man over Jingu's PA, your night was over. It helped that the 2012 ball was even deader than 2011's. Tony was free to be a lot more relaxed on the mound because there was an 8 out of 10 chance that anything barreled would die on the warning track, even in the tight confines of Jingu Stadium. Not a single CL team even hit 100 home runs that year. It made new slugger Vladimir Ballantin's CL leading 31 homers all the more impressive, as it countered for more than a third of the Swallows' total home runs that season. Barnett would be named to his first All-Star team and would lead the CL with 33 saves. Again, they'd be facing the Chinichi Dragons at the Nagoya Dome, but this time it was in the wildcard round rather than the CLCS. After getting thumped in Game 1, Barnett stepped up and tossed a two-inning save in Game 2. With the season on the line, Tony was called up again for Game 3.
溜まっていたストレスを全部吐き出しました Tony was devastated. To hear him tell it, he didn't say a word until he got back to Tokyo to pack his stuff and go home. The roar from the Nagoya Dome was still ringing in his ears the entire time. However, there was a silver lining a fresh two year deal that could reach $4.8 million if Tony met his performance goals. The Swallows had also brought back Ballantin, as well as adding a new outfielder, Lasting Smillage. The two year deal turned out to be exactly what Tony needed. After a dominant run through his first few appearances, Tony would be sidelined with an oblique strain until late May. Despite Vladimir Ballantine destroying baseballs left and right as the new Juice Ball took effect, by the time Tony got back, the Swallows were getting pummeled and now sat eight games below 500. He came back too early. The Hawks and Lions would pummel him in his next few appearances, and he'd be deregistered once again to focus on healing. When he came back in late July, fully healed this time, he went on another dominant run. The season was lost, so Tony had another goal. Get his ERA under six. He didn't quite get there, but this season really exposed the folly that is focusing solely on ERA, as his 2.84 FIP netted him a career high FIP minus of 67. He was still his dominant self. In 2014, Tony would miss parts of spring training to be there for the birth of his daughter Madeline, but while Hillary was getting the paperwork together to bring her to Japan, Tony suffered another setback a partially torn PCL. By the time he got back, the Swallows were basically out of it. Ballantin was hurt, budding superstar Tetsuri Yamada was still extremely raw, and their number three bat was Yuhei Takai, a converted pitcher who'd come out of nowhere and was hitting the cover off the ball for a surprise 5 war campaign. Still, another year with little expectations allowed Tony to get comfortable. He wasn't some fresh faced foreigner anymore, he was a four year NPV vet who had some organizational capital, and he was paying it back in full. Working a lot with the Swallows' young bullpen arms in the same way Tomohito Ito had worked with him. Tony finished the season with 14 saves, 5 holds, and a 74 fit minus, and re upped with the Swallows for 2015. The Swallows had also brought in another relief pitcher for 2015, the towering Texan Logan Andreset. And while there was some initial debate over who'd be the closer, the Swallows eventually settled on Barnett closing and having Andreset in the setup role. They also had a new manager at the helm, Mitsuru Manaka. Monaco was not only much younger than his predecessors at only 44, but he'd been with the Swallows during their Golden Age, picking up four Japan Series rings, although all but 2001 came off the bench. Still, Monaco was the fresh face the team needed. The Swallows started the season much better than the two previous because they were actually able to hang around 500. Despite missing Vladimir Ballantin and Lasting's Millage with injuries, Tetsuri Yamada was a superstar, and Shingo Kawabata and Katsuhiro Hatakayama were hitting well. Yasuhiro Ogawa and Masanori Ishikawa fronted a pretty decent pitching staff, and Andrusek and Barnett were a devastating shutdown pair. When I say Yamada was a superstar, Yamada was a superstar. Not only did he and another player put up the first Triple Three season since 2002, he also set a Swallows franchise record with an unbelievable 11.9 war, becoming the first Central League player to put up an 11 war season since Kosuke Fukudome pre elbow injury in 2006. The Swallows were still on the outside looking in come the All Star break, Tony's second All Star appearance, but everyone was waiting for them to put it all together and go on a run. And with one month left in the season, they did, finishing the season on a 28 1 run that netted them the pennant. Along the way, Tony would pick up his 38th save of the season against the Bay Stars, breaking Shingo Takatsu's club record. But the individual accomplishments didn't matter, they were chasing something bigger, their first pennant since 2001. Tony wanted it more than anything. Twice he'd seen his club go down in the playoffs, and he knew how important that first round bye and automatic win were. After missing out on clinching against the Hiroshima Carp, their October 2nd match against the Hanshin Tigers at Jingu was for everything. The Tigers, who'd made the Japan series the previous year, were no slouches, and the game went deep into the tent. Then up stepped Yuhei Takai, with runners on the corners. The Swallows had clinched the Central League. Tony would grab one more regular season save a day later, dashing the playoff hopes of the Hiroshima Carp and finishing the season with 41 saves, tying him with Dennis Sarfate and Sun Quan Oh for the NPB lead. Thus, he and Oh shared the CL Save King Award. That 41 saves put them in a four way tie with Mark Kroon, who'd saved 41 games in 2008, for the foreign save record. 
That would eventually be demolished by Sarfate, whose 54 saves in 2017 stands as the overall NPB record, but still, only one foreign closer has joined the 40 save fraternity since, and that is current Padres closer Robert Suarez, who picked up 42 saves as the Hanshin Tiger in 2021. Regardless, it was on to the playoffs, and the team they'd be facing was none other than the Yamiuri Giants. It was the Tokyo Derby CLCS, and Tony would be getting the chance for some long-awaited revenge. The Giants took game 1-4-1. However, the Swallows would respond by taking game 2-4-0, with Tony closing out the game after eight brilliant innings from ace Yasuhiro Ogawa. The next day, Barnett would pick up his first playoff save as the Swallows beat the Giants 2-0. Then he'd pick up another, with Meiji Jingu Stadium showering him a chance of let's go Barnett for the second game in a row, Tony struck out the wolf, Yoshinobu Takahashi, to send the Swallows to their first Japan series in 14 years. Tony, who lived and breathed the Tokyo Derby for six years, let out a scream of joy in vindication. They'd done it. Now it was on to the Japan series. The 2015 Swallows had an 11 war superstar, a dominant foreign closer, and an excellent supporting cast. And they were staring down another team who had an 11 war superstar, a dominant foreign closer, and an excellent supporting cast. The Fukuoka Softbank Hawks. Nobuhiro Matsuda. Daiho Lee, Akira Nakamura, Shota Takeda, Dennis Sarfate, and Yuki Yanagita. While this wasn't the greatest Hawks team of all time, it was damn close, and they proved it by locking up the pennant incredibly early, and going 90, 49, and 4. Fresh off staring down one gauntlet, the Swallows would have to stare down another, and that became incredibly clear in Game 1. Shota Takeda pitched a complete game, shutting up the Swallows, until a two-run homer in the ninth by Kasuhiro Hatakayama, which made the game seem a lot closer on paper than it actually was. In Game 2, Hawks number 2 starter Rick Vandenherk went eight scoreless innings against the Swallows, as his offense once again put up four runs. Any chance of some similar ninth inning heroics was stopped by Dennis Sarfate, who pitched a 1-2-3 ninth to put the Hawks up 2-0. The train back to Tokyo was tense, but one thing buoyed them. The Swallows were determined to go down fighting, if for no other reason than to avoid losing in their house. While manager Mitsuru Manaka had not been on the team at that point, many of his teammates had been in the house for Game 7 of the 1992 Japan Series at Jengu. It was the first Japan Series they'd actually been allowed to play at their home, instead of being forced over to Karakuen like in 1978. The 10th inning sack fly from line superstar Koji Akiyama had been the difference and that gut punch had driven the Swallows to demolish the Lions in their next two Japan Series appearances in 1993 and 1997. Tatsuya Yamada, perhaps the best all-round talent to emerge since Akiyama, took matters into his own hands in Game 3. Not one, not two, but three homers and three consecutive at-bats, setting a new Japan Series record in the process. While a three-run eighth from the Swallows prevented Tony from getting the save, he still stepped onto a Japan Series mound for the first time in Game 3, and shut down Kenta Imamiya, Barbaro Kanizares, and Yuki Yoshimura to end the game 8-4. While the Swallows would pounce all over 2012 Sawamura Award winner Tadashi Setsu in Game 4, the Hawks would do the same to Shohei Tatsuyama. Yuhei Takai could not replicate his pennant winning heroics, striking out to end the game with the tying run aboard. Hawks win 6-4. The Swallows were shut out in Game 5. Barnett would pitch in the ninth out of desperation, but gave up a run on a Yuki Yanagita RBI single. He then could only watch as Sarfate struck out Yuhei to end it. Hawks win, 5-0, and take the series in 5 games. The Swallows had to watch as the Hawks celebrated on their home turf. Then the Uruk got another gut punch. Tony had decided that he wanted to test out the free agent market rather than re-up for another year. Tony knew the interest was there, as some MLB scouts had already talked to Hillary at Jingu. But at the same time, Tony and Don Nomura didn't want to leave the team high and dry after six years of service time, so Tony asked to be posted. This not only was to try and ensure that the Swallows would get something for losing their star closer, it allowed Tony and Don to test out the free agent market and see who was interested. 
The Swallows initially asked for a $500,000 posting fee from teams looking to sign Barnett. But instead, MLB teams elected to wait out the posting period and save money. Even after the Swallows and Diamondbacks had a provisional agreement for a $250,000 posting fee in the works, the D-backs backed out, blaming it on signing Zach Greinke. So when the posting period came and went, Tony became a free agent. He would eventually sign a two-year, $3.5 million deal with Texas. Less than what he'd get in Japan, but not by much. While his four years in MLB with the Rangers and Cubs would have their ups and downs, his 2016 and 2018 seasons were utterly dominant, opening the door for other MLB teams to take notice of foreign NPB relievers, and further proving that NPB was no pushover league. In the six years he spent in Tokyo, the Barnets became part of the Yakult faithful. Swallows fans applauded Tony's rise from adversity to become their guardian angel, and his role in the Cinderella run that matched their first pennant run in 1978. To this day, Tony and Hillary's Arizona home is full of stuff they were gifted by Swallows fans over the years. Charms, keychains, memorabilia, the crocheted bears fans sent to their wedding, artist caricatures of Tony, the baby shower gifts given to Madeline, all of them remind them of their time in Tokyo every day. Ever since his retirement after the 2019 season, Tony has been an advisor and a scout for the Swallows, and maintains connections with many of his former teammates. To this day, Tony remains the only Swallow to register more than 40 saves in a season, and is one of only 10 players to pull it off most of whom are regarded as some of the greatest closers in NPB history. Tony lived up to his number. If you're wondering why this video is so long and detailed, it's actually thanks to a book, A Baseball Gaijin by Aaron Fishman. It's an excellent read, full of a ton of stories that I wish I could include here, but I didn't want to because I want you to buy the book, it's that good. So, link to that will be in the description, and I just want to say a quick thank you to Aaron for gifting me an advanced copy in order to help with this video. And as always, a big shout out to my patrons, Alex Irish, Bear Kaufman, The Baseball Brit, Brandon Two, Channing D, Claire Haggerty, Cody, Evan B, G, Gordon Benson, Joe Hiranaka, Jonah, Juan Jose Sanchez Bracamontes, Julian Willie, Lucas Borgia, Mentasmic, Ryan Fox, Frilled Shark, Tim Dog, Edmund Dickinson, Nat Lang, Tom Musa, Anthony Pang, and Eric Cooper. Should you wish to join them, the link will be in the description. And to everyone else, thank you so much for watching. I've been Gaijin Baseball. Peace.